Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The world of space technology has seen the use of many high-tech materials, alloys of steel, aluminium, titanium, composites like carbon fibre, plastics, and occasionally wood. Yes, in some cases, the engineering properties of wood have meant that it fits the bill perfectly. In aviation, wood has had a long history. In fact, for a long time, the aircraft with the largest wingspan was built entirely of wood. It was the H-4 Hercules, better known as the Spruce Goose. But it's possible to get aircraft that fly not much faster than a car. Flying to space, on the other hand, that is a whole extra order of magnitude in terms of forces, energies, and velocities. So how could an everyday material like wood handle the forces and energies required to make it to space? Well, the truth is, wood is an everyday material because it's a useful material. It has many great properties. And I'm actually going to start with something that's technically not wood. It's the bark. Cork has a long history as an industrial material. It's impermeable, it's pliable, and it's a very good insulator, which is why it's used as corks. It's also used as insulation in rockets. This is a small launch vehicle from Vector Launch, and as you can see, the entire structure is covered in cork. Cork is a fantastic insulator, and you can create layers of it. You can also bind it with synthetic polymers to make it stronger, and it will work equally well, preventing cryogenic fuel from cooling the exterior too much, and for in-flight heating, heating up the spacecraft too much. In terms of thermal conductivity and structural strength, there are certainly synthetic polymer foams which work a lot better when you have the area to work with or the depth, or, but uh, cork still works for many, many applications. Here it is applied to the leeward side of the Schiaparelli lander, which of course crashed into the surface, but not because the heat shielding failed. Here's the same material applied to a sounding rocket. And more importantly, here's a post-flight analysis showing the thickness of the surface, the charring layer, and the untouched layer underneath. It's not just some historical anomaly that means this get used. In the SLS, the boat tail, or rather the engine section at the bottom, is coated with a layer of cork. Now, the cork is also overlaid with paint and other protective materials, but underneath it, there is an organic material that has literally been cut off of trees. And to be fair, trees have spent hundreds of millions of years evolving this perfect material, so it should be no surprise that we, as humans, have found ways to make use of it in our most high-tech products. Anyway, as I said, that's not technically wood, that's the bark, but actual wood has been used as a heat shield, and not just to shield components from you know the casual heat of burning rocket motors, but from the intense flames of re-entry. China in the 1970s developed a reusable satellite. It was called the Fanhui Shei Weiqing, and I'm probably mis mispronouncing that, so I'm just going to call it FSW from this point onwards. Anyway, China started launching these spacecraft in the middle of the 1970s. They were a couple of tons. They would be launched on board a Long March 2 rocket, and they would spend a few weeks in space, supposedly doing scientific research in zero-G. But most people also expected that they were, were doing uh, reconnaissance imaging at the same time. And yes, the reason they're in this list is because the heat shield was made of wood. It was about 6 inches, 15 centimeters of white oak. Obviously, you might think that wood is a bad heat shield because, well, it burns. In fact, we use it to heat things up. But during re-entry, it works like almost any other ablative heat shield. Uh, the heat comes in and it uh, basically causes the wood to char and it forms this black carbon layer which protects the material underneath. Now this gets blown off by uh, you know, pressure from the atmosphere, but then there's fresh material underneath that chars and creates another thick layer. This is exactly how the heat shield on the Dragon works, you know, with its uh, phenolic impregnated carbon ablator. The phenolic resin in there is essentially a fancy plastic which undergoes a similar process. It loses the hydrogen and leaves behind the carbon and protects the spacecraft during re-entry. We do have a few pictures of the recovery but it's hard to tell just how effective it was but the spacecraft clearly was successful enough to operate for 20 years. 
In the early days of the American space program, balsa wood turned up in quite a few test systems, but it was also a leading candidate for the tank installation on the hydrogen tank of the upper stage of the Saturn V rocket. The problem here wasn't that it was uh, inadequate for the purpose, the problem was they couldn't source enough for the Apollo program. The engineers involved in creating the replacement essentially set out to manufacture synthetic balsa wood. But real homegrown balsa wood did actually make it to space, and indeed make it to the surface of the moon. This is the Ranger satellite or spacecraft Block 2, and they included a spherical seismic package. Now inside that was actually a small seismometer in the middle. Most of it was actually taken up by a shock absorber made of balsa wood. The whole capsule also contained oil to support the seismometer in the middle, and the idea was that the landing on the moon would be pretty rough, but the instruments in the middle of that would be protected. They were also suspended in a bath of oil, and after landing, after the thing stopped moving, they would puncture this, let the oil drain out, and the seismometer would naturally end up sitting the right way up on the lunar surface, ready to send data back to Earth. Unfortunately, Ranger 3 missed the moon, Ranger 5 missed the moon, and Ranger 4 crashed into the far side of the moon and therefore was unable to deliver any data back to Earth. But hey, that does mean there are two wooden spaceships still flying out there in deep space and I'm sure Bob Shaw would be proud. Now in reality, wood is probably not ideal for a spaceship hull because it's porous, it contains water and it changes under, you know, the ultraviolet radiation. But there are scientists out there working to address these shortcomings and turn wood into a material able to hold its head up high next to carbon fibre and other modern materials. For example, this team claims to have been able to make wood 10 times stronger by essentially boiling the wood to remove excess lignin and cellulose and then compressing it to remove the gaps in the cell structure. But coming from the other direction, engineers and scientists have been able to make metallic wood, essentially wood-like structures at the you know, microscopic level, but with metal instead of lignin. Maybe in the future some of these materials will find their way into rockets and spacecraft, but as of right now, wood has gone places and done things that your casual space observer probably didn't think was possible. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.